we probably have some questions from the audience. I definitely want to uh, give opportunity um, for you to ask some questions. But um, I wanted to start off just by talking a little bit about um, the production itself and the process. Um, so now we don't have to have spoiler alerts because all of you know that Nai Nai is still alive. <laughs> <laughs> they ac you actually filmed, uh, well, 90% of the production was filmed um, in your Nai Nai's hometown. Um, and she was there, but you had to sort of keep it a secret from her, I understand, about what you were talking, what you were filming about and the story of the film while you were there. Yeah, uh, you know, obviously I wanted her to be part of the process. Like, it was kind of um, a miracle for her to be able to see her granddaughter, like, directing a film with all these um, Americans that, you know, we brought back. And she was really excited because, you know, we were like the celebrities of her hometown, and so she would come to set all the time, but at the same time, couldn't let her know what the movie was about. So it was really tricky to both invite her, but not invite her. Like, we, she would be on set and we'd, um, you know, make sure she was staying away from Video Village, and there was a scene that we were shooting in her neighborhood, the goodbye scene, where they're hugging and crying, and the neighbors were all around, and they were watching the scene, and they were all crying, and then my grandma was on set, and she went up to Nora, and she was like, are you okay? Why are you crying? Nora was like, in her head, was like, told me later, she was like thinking, if you only knew, Nai Nai, if you only knew, and she like, obviously couldn't say that, so. Yeah. And so obviously, even now, um, she still hasn't seen the film, and she still doesn't know. No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, for the, for the, you have a really diverse cast, a uh, Chinese cast, and also a uh, Chinese-American cast. Um, can you talk about a little bit about um, how you found these actors to play members of your own family? And um, also in the lead role, uh, Nora Lam, AKA Aquafina, um, who plays, well, you. Um, and she was actually here in our fall festival last year, um, the recipient of our Hif Maverick Award. Um, so some of you folks uh, were here for that as well last year. But yeah, can you talk a little bit about that process? Yeah, um, in, it, with um, this one? Jimmy, let's trade. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, with, with when when I um, was talking to Aquafina, you know, she was really um, interested in the project because she has a personal connection with her, um, her own grandmother, uh, her Chinese grandmother. Her mother was Korean, and her mother passed away when she was four, and she was raised by her um, grandmother on her father's side, who's Chinese, and. Um, you know, I think like she was the first person we had to cast. We couldn't greenlight the film without somebody to play Billy, and it was um, a, a difficult role to cast because of the, the character has to speak both languages and has to feel very American in the way they speak English. And that was the main priority for me in finding that cast. But obviously, somebody who spoke enough Chinese that they could communicate with the grandma and like have a relationship. Um, and um, yeah, Nora was just so passionate about the project and the role because of her own relationship. And I saw um, she sent in a self tape and it was so good. And so we met for coffee and, um, and talked about it. And you know, I think she was nervous because she, one, she hadn't done a drama before. And also, it, like, it's not easy to play um, a character that's based on the writer and director. It's like, you know, and so she was like, I didn't no want to, exactly, like, and she didn't want to misrepresent this and that, and I told her, you know, like, you're not playing me, and I never thought about Billy necessarily as me. Other people, I think, saw that. My parents and, uh, you know, my friends, they would say, oh, so you, like, Aquafina, like, that's an interesting choice for you, because she and I are very different in real life. But I, I didn't think about it that way. I said, you know, you're not trying to learn my mannerisms. Like, this isn't a biopic about me. It's about an experience of a young immigrant woman who goes back to where she comes from. And there's a universality to that. And you should play that, to, that in a way that's authentic to your emotions as opposed to trying to mimic me, you know? Right, right. right. And were you, with that same approach you feel you took with um, the other cast members, in the same way, they're not trying to play your parents, 
you know, they're trying to play comparing. So Philly in this experience. Um, yeah, and obviously, um, like the, all of my parents were out during pre-production, and so the actors playing them got to meet them. And um, um, Zhao, who plays uh, Nai Nai, she met real Nai Nai. I think they had breakfast together. Um, <laughs> and um, so it was for all of the actors, it was more about learning who these people were, where they come from, and the diversity of that, because you know, if you're Chinese, I think in America you just go, they're just all Chinese. Mm -hmm. But these, to these actors, they're like, well, what kind of Chinese are you? Like, did you grow up during the Cultural Revolution? How did that influence you? Oh, my grandma was in the army. Oh, okay, she left for the army at 14. She's really tough, you know? And um, the actress playing her learned all of this information about her and wanted to make sure that that spirit of, the, of, the, of that character is mm -hmm. captured. Um, and similarly, Tai Ma, who plays my dad, um, you know, hung out with my dad all the time. And it was like the best research for them. Are they friends? <laughs> um, Tai likes to think that they're friends. During like an interview, there, somebody asked like, if you could be locked in a room with somebody during a snowstorm, who would it be? And he said, my dad. <laughs> I was like, okay, um, but um, but Ty, like during the production, would often actually get mad at me because he's like, I feel like you're not representing enough of your father. Like he speaks Russian. Why isn't that in there? And he's a diplomat, and you know, like all this stuff. And I was like, that's not what the movie's about. I can't put all that stuff in there. Like, but he got to know my dad in this such like um, a deep way. And there were things that he he would tell me sometimes on set. He'd be like, you know, you da 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 about your dad. And I was like, wait, I didn't know that. And he's like, yeah, I know, I know. I know so much more than you do. And I'm like, what? What have you guys been talking about? And he's like, let me go call your father, hold on. And like, I'm like, wait, you guys have this relationship now. And he's like, there's things that, you know, a father cannot tell a daughter. I was like, thanks, Ty. Like, you put your, I'm like, you know, and it was great, but it was, you know, but they're of the same generation, but they grew up in different countries. Um, and so it was just wonderful that they got to, and similarly the actress playing my mother knew that she was a writer who doesn't write anymore. And I think that's the kind of specificity that, um, that like this cast was able to bring that I think that in a, in, you know, when we're not telling our own stories, that it's so easy to skip those things because you're just like, well, you're Asian, just play Asian, whatever, you know? Whereas in this situation, like everyone got all of the backstory in such a deep way and that's how they were. Even on, on a screen with like 13 people at a table, everybody at every moment is carrying the backstory of their own character and I think that really lends itself to feeling the family. Authenticity of it, yeah. And wasn't there a member, a member of your own family actually in yeah. the cast as well? Yes, uh, so little Nai Nai, little Nai Nai, great, uh, my great aunt, she plays herself. Um, as does Ellen. Ellen is her dog, uh, uh, and Ellen plays herself. And if you heard the This American Life, Ellen um, got her name from a foreign exchange student named Ellen, who stayed with my grandma for like several months, and uh, an American foreign exchange student um, who studied Chinese and was staying with my grandma. And my grandma was always yelling at her. <laughs> And was always like, Ellen, Ellen, like, don't sleep with people. You can make friends, but you can't, like, go to bed with them. Um, and so the, my grandma was always yelling at her. And then when she left, they all felt this void of not being able to yell Ellen anymore. So they named the dog Ellen. After this origin, so I'm just really excited for the day that real Ellen, who I think lives, like, in Atlanta or somewhere, Savannah, Tennessee, somewhere like that, uh, for real Ellen to see the movie and see that the dog Ellen has a cameo. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, besides, besides your grandma, um, the rest of your family, uh, have they seen the film? Your parents, you know, is there any feedback? Are they sort of overwhelmed by the whole experience? Uh, my parents saw it um, at Sundance, and then little Nine I saw a little bit of it while we were driving in a car to a barbecue restaurant. Um, she saw it on a phone and then we got to the restaurant. We were like, okay, that's enough of that. Um, and so she hasn't seen the whole thing yet. And yeah, I think everyone is proud. Uh, my parents were really overwhelmed. My, my mother was like, after Sundance, she said, it was my brother and my boyfriend, and she was like, I'm not like that woman. That's, that woman is not like me, me at all. I'm not that mean, am I? 
And my boyfriend was like, no, you're nothing like her. Um, she's so mean, and you know, you have to understand as filmmakers, like, you know, we have to dramatize things, you're nothing like her. And my brother goes, no, she's exactly like that. Mom, you are exactly like that. <laughs> so, I can't, I mean, I'm glad that my brother came to my defense and said, I, and he's like, I'm pretty sure you said most of those exact lines to me before at some point in my life. So, there's authenticity in that. There's authenticity in that. So there were, you know, you did, you did, were able to pull specific dialogue um, and moments uh, in the film that were actually things that your family members had said, um, and you had details that, you know, you had experienced. I think earlier we were talking a little bit about how you tried to, you know, although there were broad, there were things that are obviously different from your real experience, but how you tried to stay true to some of the, the details of your family experience um, in China. Yeah, I mean, w like when stuff happened during, part of like how I've gotten through life in general since I was young was I would journal. And so I um, would often just like, if I had no place to put my emotions, I would just write about it. And so while I was going through the this event in China, I was writing down some of the details of how crazy things were, like that walk with my uncle, mm -hmm. like that really happened to me. And I was like, that was so weird. Why did he just keep repeating these things? And I knew that I, there was no way for me to like express that because I couldn't just call up a friend and be like, so my uncle kept saying these things over, like that wouldn't make sense, right? And I couldn't go to my parents either. They were just like, oh, you know, your uncle's weird, whatever. But I felt there was a tone there that I wanted to capture that was both funny and like sad and weird. Um, so I would take all of these notes down and same with like my cousin crying and all this stuff. Um, and then uh, I set, would set it aside. And, but it was great because I had all of these notes written mm -hmm. down and I had written a short story version before I made the movie because I didn't think I would ever get to make the movie. So I thought before I forget all of this stuff, I have to put it into some kind of like a story form. So I wrote a rare, very rough first draft of, um, of, the, of, of the story. It's like a short story form. Mm -hmm. And then when I started making the movie, Every time I got in a fight with my mom, and my grandma was still sick at the time, and there was, and she was still being insensitive, and so every time we got in a fight, I would be like screaming at her and yelling, but then in the background, I'd just be like typing. <laughs> I'd be like, oh, I'm so, what, what was that? Can you repeat? Okay. And I was just like, so some of the stuff that I, and then later, it was so weird, because later she would read the script and be like, I never said that, why are you exaggerating? I was like, Mom, I literally typed out, why, why were you typing when we were talking? That's an invasion of privacy. Um, but, you know, and I had this evidence, because I did type out some of the stuff that she said. <laughs> so yeah, lots of... And, and was that short story that you wrote, was that sort of the source material that ended up um, evolving into the This American Life podcast episode? Um, yes, from the short story. The short yeah. story. Yeah. yeah, I actually used that as a pitch because um, they, the producer, Neil Drumming, had saw, saw my short film at um, a film festival and said, what other stories do you have? I was like, well, there's this um, story that I wanted to make as a film, and I don't think it's going to happen. Um, so I wrote it out as a short story, hoping one day maybe I'd publish it. But it's just a first draft. But you can take a look at it. At least it has some of the, like, you know, the basic information of the story. That, so that's what he showed everyone, like Ira Glass, everyone at mm -hmm. This American Life. And that's what got this, the project greenlit at mm -hmm. This American Life. Um, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Well, I want to make sure that we do have um, some time for questions from the audience. So please raise your hand if you have a question. I'm going to stand up out of the spotlight so I can see your hands. Yes, right here in the front. This might be a little personal, but what happened to the cancer? Sorry, what happened to the cancer? cancer. Did she still have it? Oh, yeah, she's, she still has it. Um, she's not doing so great, so I'm, I'm sure it's developing. But, um, but yeah, she's a fighter. So it's been how many years now? Um, over six years. Over six years to film now, yeah. Oh, sorry, there's one more thing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, do you play the piano? I just said, I just play the piano. Oh, oh so was well, you playing the piano in the back? Or what? No, that was not me playing. Uh, my composer wrote the piece, but yeah. Are there questions? I did, write the, I did play the piano in the opera song, though. Oh. <laughs> Please raise your hands high. No more columns. Yes, right there in the middle. Speak loud. It's 
three questions? Yes, we're going to the I remember in the This American Life piece, uh, they talked about having, uh, like, the Chinese, I think they said, like, Changxi or something, about having to, like, refill the body with happiness. Have you guys ever considered, like, a, oh, five-year reunion? It's like, bring your back. The question is, are they considering a five-year reunion? Um, because there's this, uh, for those who haven't heard of This American Life, Chongxi is this uh, Chinese philosophy. Um, Chong is to, like, rinse or to like wash and see is joy and so you the, the belief is that you can wash away um illness with joy um and if we've had considered a five-year reunion uh no that was me making the movie basically that was a reunion and my grandma getting to come see me direct on a movie set in her own neighborhood amazing uh, we have time for a couple more yes right here right here and then up there How's the married couple? Are they still married? Or? Oh, your cousin, is he still married? Yeah, they're still married. <laughs> <laughs> One more time. Yep, right here in the middle. Yep. I noticed that you used a lot of group shots or two shots or more. Um, even the shots where it was just one character on screen, that's, that felt wide too. Was that an aesthetic choice or an emotional choice? Uh, both, I guess. You know, um, we, we decided to shoot um, in a wider aspect ratio, which has traditionally been used mostly for like landscapes and things like that, but we really wanted to show a landscape of a family <coughs> and um, the landscape of the number of people and faces in a family and be able to put them all in one frame. Um, so, yeah, so we chose that for the family, but I think that what you feel is that then when they're not in the frame, when it's just Billy, then you feel their absence and you feel the isolation of her in that large frame where a family should be. And so I think that, yes, it's both, both aesthetic as well as the extra um, headroom and things like that as well because it's emotional. I did feel well. Thank you. Any question right here? What was the significance of the bird in your apartment and then in the hotel? The significance of the bird in the apartment. Um, I think for me, the bird, I mean, I put the bird in there because I had a lot of incidences um, in the last few years of these strange coincidences that were like difficult for me to explain to people because I would be like, this thing is here, but I just saw this thing in this, and they would be like, what are you talking about? And um, so the bird for me is sort of just about perspective because you can kind of look at some, if you read into things, it can be a sign um, but if you're also a person who's cynical, it could mean nothing, right? And it's sort of like similar to how you look at this the disease with Nai Nai and telling her or not telling her. I think if you believe something, then, you, then it has meaning. But if you don't believe something, then it has no meaning. And it just depends on your perspective. Um, and so the bird, it can have meaning if you believe if you saw that bird before and you see it again, but to somebody who doesn't believe, it can just be like, okay, there's just birds everywhere, you know. Time for maybe one more question. Yep, yeah, straight back here. Yeah. Could you comment on your background music, which seemed to be totally vocal and European, while you were having a film about Asian people in China? Music. The selection of music, I mean, I wouldn't say that it's European because they they're, they're, they're not singing words. It's just like ooh, ooh, oohs. Um, so it, it's, I mean, it comes from classical, traditional music. Um, I think that, you know, I'm a classically trained pianist. Um, so I grew up with classical music my whole life. and. I wanted to use voices to represent the number of voices in the family. Um, we actually hired um, a, a guy to do the main falsetto voice, the soloist that you hear throughout, because I wanted something that felt sort of androgynous to represent um, Billy, that because it, it's not a specifically like female story. Um, and I think there's something haunting as well about the male falsetto voice. Um, in juxtaposition with a choir of voices. And I was really inspired by like, you know, Greek uh, comedies 
and I thought a lot about operas as well throughout, and so all of that played as inspiration. I also thought it was really, would be fun, yes, having the voices represent the voices of the family versus her in that kind of Greek style, but um, also there's no piano throughout, and like, that was a really interesting idea to me because of the way that she sort of like has, um, has shunned piano playing because it was forced upon her. Um, and so yeah, we just um, decided to do like, it was all written by my composer, Alex Weston, um, but we used a classical style but modernized it by using vocals and acapella as opposed to just instruments. Well, I think that we are quite out of time for tonight, but before we go, um, I know that the film is coming out theatrically in the summer, so uh, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about the release plans, especially here in Hawaii, so that we can, uh, folks can share with their friends and family. Uh, Nicolette? <laughs> when, uh, July 26th in Hawaii. Uh, we're, yeah, coming out J July 12th in New York, LA, and then it'll come out to here. So definitely by the end of July, and I hope you guys um, come check it out and bring your families. Well, thank you so much for being with us here in Honolulu tonight.